Good morning. My name's Jerry Agner. Pastor asked me to give you my salvation story. I was, uh, my story's not a one time instance where everything changed. I was raised in the Catholic Church. My daughter, my father grew up Baptist. My mother was Catholic. My grandfather on my father's side attended the Baptist Church every Sunday. My grandmother walked three blocks to the Catholic Church every day to attend Mass. My grandmother was a prayer warrior. My dad converted to Catholic Church because at that time, that's what you did. But he was still strong in faith. My walk with God began in the Catholic Church. I went to parochial school. And we were inundated with the education, the learning, the teaching of who and what God was. I had the head knowledge down pat. I met my wife. And uh, when I was dating her, I would go to Saturday evening mass. And at the time she was attending the Methodist church in Atchison. And I would attend the Methodist church with her on Sunday morning. And on Sunday evening, we'd attend this little church in Iatan. This church. As we continued to go through this process, one evening, they were holding a revival service. And in the service, although I had the head knowledge, I had actually met Christ. He came into my heart at that point. I had the heart knowledge. It was a change. Instead of doing things because that's what you should do, I did things. I walked the walk because that's what God wanted me to do. Life has not been easy. There are many things in life that were struggles and many joys too. An example, my life, as I got older, I've experienced pain such as arthritis, which caused me to take ibuprofen. Believe it or not, that arthritis was a blessing in disguise. Because when I, I was taking the ibuprofen, when I had a heart attack three years ago, it was not as serious as it could have been because my blood was thinned because of the ibuprofen. The next year, two years ago, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. After having the surgery, my doctor informed me that it, you had stage one. Stage one does not bleed. And the reason why they caught the colon cancer at stage one was because I was taking ibuprofen or blood thinner from the heart attack. If it had not been for the heart attack, I would not have been taking the blood thinner and I would not have bled and they would not have caught the colon cancer. Every day with Jesus, is a walk that I enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. That was incredible. Salvation stories, we all have them. They encourage us. They progress through our journey. Salvation is not just a one-time event. It is the continuing story of our lives. I got my first real part-time job when I was in the ninth grade. It was at a Minuteman restaurant. My orientation was filling out paperwork and being shown around. Then, 
I was supposed to train alongside someone to learn the ropes. That was a pretty good plan until on the first day at the dinner hour, a crowd hit. People were lined up at the register, people were lined up at the drive through window, and all of a sudden, I was abandoned and told to run the drink station. Now, the drink station included a pop machine, a tea canister, a bun coffee maker, and a shake machine with three different kinds of shakes, and I was on my own. Well, I was just hitting my stride with the drink station with the Coca-Cola machine when all of a sudden the light came on. I was out of Coke. I had no idea what to do Coke with that. So I hollered at the busy sandwich maker and he hollered back, go change the canister. What? You mean Coke comes from a canister? I ran to the back and there were all kinds of canisters. There were like 20 canisters and they had all kinds of tubes running to them and all kinds of connectors and I had no idea what to do. So I hollered at the cook who was in the back and thankfully he came and helped me. I no more than got the Coca-Cola running when I needed to refill the coffee. Well, our family had an automatic coffee maker at home. Surely there couldn't be any difference. But if any of you have ever run a bun coffee maker, then you know you better have a coffee pot underneath when you put the water in. Because if you don't, you will have a lake of water at your feet. Surprise, surprise. About the time I figured out how to make the coffee maker work, the milkshake machine. Well, let's, let's just say I know what it feels like to wear milkshake. You see, I didn't get much pre-prep or training. What I got was an education in on-the-job training. This morning we will look at Acts chapter 14. I will be using the New King James Version and we'll talk about these in sections. Verse 1. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude of both the Jews and of the Greeks believed but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews, part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Jews and Gentiles with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region. Paul and Barnabas initially presented the good news of freedom in Jesus Christ, and it was well received by both the Jews and the local Greek people. I'm sure they were excited and joyful because so many believed. And I bet they thought, this is how the job is supposed to go. Until the pot machine went dry, the coffee maker leaked water everywhere, and the milkshake machine spewed its contents. You see, opposition and or difficulty of some kind will always come into the mix when people are believing and receiving the gospel. But instead of shaking the dust off their feet like they did in the last chapter, Paul and Barnabas stayed. And they stayed for a significant amount of time. The believers in Iconium continued to grow, but the opposition did too. Verse 4 tells us their preaching divided the city. At that point, the unbelieving Jews and Gentiles decided to kill Barnabas and Paul. The guys learned of the plot and they headed out. They hit the road. Their on-the-job training taught them to stay until there were enough believers for a congregation. 
their on-the-job training taught them wisdom in knowing when to stay and when to go. For us, just like Paul and Barnabas, the first step is to share. We share our salvation stories in the places where we find ourselves. You've been hearing some examples for the last few weeks, and I so appreciate everyone who has testified. And if you notice, none of their testimonies took very long. Be encouraged. Share your salvation story. It won't take very long. And it will help others be introduced, get to know Jesus, or get to know him better. You see, there are people out there who are like Kelly and have no religious background. And there are some like Jerry who have head knowledge but need heart knowledge. Some like Glenda and Justin who were raised to believe but as young adults came to a place of decision as to whether Jesus would be king and ruler of their lives. Another tidbit in this section of scripture, like Paul and Barnabas, we're to assist people in becoming a part of a community of faith so they can gain strength, so they can have a support system. That's why in our church we aren't just trying to get people to make a decision for Christ. We're helping them be a part of the family of God. This text also reminds us that opposition will come, and when it does, we pray for wisdom. We let the Holy Spirit guide us, and we really can trust God to give us what to say, when to say it, or even when to be quiet. We can trust the Lord to tell us when to go and when to stay. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Verse 6. They became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region. And they were preaching the gospel there. And in Lystra, a certain man, without strength in his feet, was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul observed him intently, and seeing that he had the faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now, when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods, small g, have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermas, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain and heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitude from sacrificing to them. Okay, I have to give you a word picture here. When Paul and Barnabas left Iconium and went into the region of Lystra and Derbe, we must understand these guys went to the boonies. They went to the hills. I would guess there was banjo music playing in the background. These areas were places where there was no synagogue, which means there were less than 10 Jewish men in the community. Hence, as they strolled into Lystra, these two missionaries couldn't start with their usual Jewish context. They couldn't start with a God context. This backwashed town was steeped in superstition, which was reality to the inhabitants. So they began their sermon this time with God the Creator rather than Moses, David, or Messiah. 
They don't even get to the Jesus part before Paul discerns someone is already experiencing the presence of God and has faith to believe. So he calls the man to healing and the man is healed. But in that moment, the dinner hour rush crowd hit. Paul and Barnabas are put in a situation they would have never predicted. The people think they're Zeus and Hermes, Greek gods in human form. The town folks can't be quieted and the local priest brings bulls to sacrifice to these preachers. And these two good Jewish boys, they tear their clothes, they run amok, because in the Jewish uh, thinking, tearing your clothes was a indicated blasphemy. But it meant nothing to the people. And Paul and Barnabas can hardly get them to listen. In the end, by continuing to tell who God is, the people are quelled. And what we discover is what these people were trying to do was to add this new God, Jesus, to their already established belief system. I mean, this God had the power to heal. Didn't you see it? So let's add this God to our pantheon. Listen to what happens next. Verse 19. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Boy, from trying to worship Paul to pelting him. Some people came in saying, hey, these guys really aren't Zeus and Hermes like they say. But what they are preaching is going to require total change in belief, behavior, and belonging for you. They are going to teach you that Jesus is the only God, so you cannot just add him to your ideas and opinions. If you believe what they say, it means everything in your life is going to change. And when the people hear that, what do they do? They don't just think about murder, but actually follow through with the stoning of Paul, then drag him outside the city and leave him for dead. I'm telling you right now, country folk don't mess around. On the job training, Paul and Barnabas got it. And for us, we may attempt to share and people won't even hear what we are really saying. They may only hear what they want to hear because they don't want their lives to get messed with. They aren't looking for transformation, change, and or the Holy Spirit's rearranging of everything. They'd just like to have some fire insurance or life to be better or a sickness to go away or a nice community to hang out with. And when they discover the gospel is talking about making Jesus Christ Lord, ruler, and king, when they discover that it's going to change every aspect of our world, they may cast some stones. They may leave us for the next spiritual best thing they can control on the job training. It can get messy, confusing, can even cause us to get hurt. But it's worth it. Chapter 20, I mean verse 20. However, when the disciples gathered around him, Paul, he rose up and went into the city. When the disciples, did you catch that? Disciples. It's no longer Paul and Barnabas. There are disciples. You see, from Paul and Barnabas' sharing their salvation story, even in Redneck Lystra, some had come to belief. And God uses them right off the bat. He uses them before they really know anything. They gather around Paul's lifeless body, and they pray, and he stands up. He's healed. Here in the village of Lystra, we have some people who have a new salvation story. 
But we also see Paul's salvation story has a new chapter. Salvation's just, it's not just a one-time event. It is the continuing story of our lives. End of verse 20. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atelia. Paul and Barnabas have certainly added adventures to their salvation stories. But the mission, the call, was to share the good news of Jesus and make disciples. Their on-the-job training has grown them, ensured confidence in God's provision, and given them courage. They wipe off the splattered milkshake and go back to the job. The very cities that they were run out of, stoned, threatened. They continue the work. They don't check out. They check in. They check in on the people who receive the good news. They don't let opposition stop them. They don't let rejection slow them down. They go right back to strengthen the new believers, encourage their faith, and appoint leaders so that the mission continues. They pray and fast together and they entrust these new Christians and new churches, new leaders into the hands of a faithful God. Chapter 14 ends with Paul and Barnabas coming full circle, going back to the place where they had received the call and the commission, going back to the place to refuel and get ready for the next journey. We, you and I, we're called to mission. We're called to share our stories. We're called to help others hear about it, receive it, and grow in Jesus. We are called to encourage and help one another. We're called to refuel and renew in community. Our bodies of faith, regardless of whether it's in the sanctuary, drive-in church, or on the internet, we are called to be one. We are the body of Christ, and we are in the middle of on-the-job training. Share your story. Let's pray. God of righteousness and truth, you brought us into your body, the church, to display by our life lived together, by our salvation stories told, You've given us unity so that we can share your love. Please, oh Heavenly Father, give us the full measure of your Holy Spirit that we may encourage each other and we may have courage to go or do whatever you call us to. We are on a journey of faith, teaching, speaking, and living out what Jesus has done in us, for us. Father, we give you thanks for hearing our prayer. And today, Lord, there is so much happening in our world. We ask, we ask that you would be with those who are sick. We ask that you would be with those, Lord, who are um, grieving. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would please touch and comfort them. We also pray, Lord, that you would provide work and income for anyone who's in need. And Lord, we ask that you would be uh, with businesses in general, but especially be with the businesses of our community. That as they are responsive to your voice, you will prosper them. Make it so, Lord. Lord, we thank you for those who are finishing up the school year. And Lord, we thank you so much for teachers and students alike. Be with them. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to keep them connected too. They give each other strength. Father, we pray especially for our 
um, graduate from high school this year who's in a really different time, be with Sam Rotterman, Lord, as, as she begins her next journey um, into the university world. And Father, please guide us and give us opportunity. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with us and thank you for our eternal hope. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Receive the benediction. We have been blessed with salvation. Tell it. Show it. Live it everywhere you go.